In my presentation, I would like to focus on the question in what way participatory documentary film projects on the topic of migration contribute to giving migrants a voice. Do iDocs or web documentaries really lead to an empowerment of the stakeholders or more precisely of the actors in Bruno Latour's sense? In my contribution, I will first deal with the conventional media representations of migration in order to then present three strategies with which participatory documentary film projects differ from these and in which ways they contribute to an empowerment of the actors. My starting point are reflections on the concept of post-migration, as presented by Errol Yildiz and Naika Furutan in recent years. They emphasized that today's debate on migration should no longer be only about migration as a factor of destabilization coming from outside, but also about the promise of all democratic societies of equal participation. In this respect, the following discussion is less about migrants and more about the potential of participation of all members of a democratic society. Therefore, a post-migrant analysis examines representations of migration in terms of whether and to what extent they are able to develop a narrative that no longer sees migration only as a problem or judges migrants only in terms of their usefulness or ability to integrate into the majority society, but to create post-migrant narratives that lead to the negotiation of equality, participation and recognition as central promises of a democratic society. In order not to go beyond the scope of my contribution, I will refrain from an in-depth discussion of the theoretical dimensions of this topic here. In my following remarks, I will first show how migration is treated in the exploitation cycle of mass media, and then outline three strategies web documentaries try to break this exploitation cycle. I'm especially interested in the question of whether and by which means web documentaries enhance the empowerment of the different actors. I will first come to the representation of migration in the familiar information formats of the mass media. The public image of migration is primarily shaped by the practices of daily newspapers, magazines or television news or through online publications. They are based on cliched images of refugees, for example, refugees in crowded, rickety boats on the coasts of the European Union, refugees outside the border fences, refugees crowding railway stations, refugees in overcrowded, improvised camps on the Greek island with inhuman hygiene conditions. The images are the result of the mass media's news practices. They were selected and transformed to illustrate and effectively color the word commons. In the narrative prevailing in 2015, for example, images of refugees were supposed to show both the humanitarian plight of the fugitives and the overstrain of the state. The images are part of a media exploitation cycle. The speed of dissemination increases the less individually designed they are, but the more often they appear, the faster they consume themselves. The cliched visual language of news editors does not lead to irritation. It tempts people not to look more closely. The images gradually disappear from the audience attention in the everyday routines of media use. In this sense, their practices do not hide these images, but level the problems they describe through endless repetition. They often serve far more to confirm preformed expectations than to transport really new information. The Transit Migration Research Group states, in Germany, the clichés of refugees as victims, petitioners, or as their negatives dominate the human traffickers as criminal perpetrators. I now come to the strategies of web documentaries with which media makers try to break the exploitation cycles of the established mass media. In my research, I could discover above all, first, strategies of outbidding conventional forms of immersion, second, strategies of negotiating participation, and third, strategies of constructing relational complexity. 
these strategies cannot always be clearly separated from each other in the projects. Rather, they are sometimes mixed and overlapped in one and the same project. In the following, I will therefore only highlight the predominant features of one or the other strategy, even if the respective projects also show features of the other strategies. I am here only interested in a brief sketch of these strategies to illustrate how they work in order to understand also their aporias, which are inscribed in the dynamics of media use and always limit the effects of individual strategies. The strategy of output in conventional forms of immersion aims to involve the viewer in the presented action through emotional, spectacular, interactive or ludic forms of immersion. This strategy is used by technical pioneers with artistic aspirations, but also to some extent by the established mass media themselves, as many journalists are aware that the format imposed by the mass media shorten and simplify the topic of migration all too much. In order to look behind the superficial conventions of media representations, they try to get closer to the people and to create a more authentic impression through emotionalization and personalization. The aim is to involve users in the media presentation through curiosity, immersion, or empathy. The problem with the outbidding strategy is that it has to outbid itself again and again. The problem is that the audience is already familiar with the events from the news and which already have a high level of emotionalization. To outbid this is difficult. A strategy of outdoing with at least one of the described features is necessary to get attention. This was impressively shown by the publication of the photo of Ilan Kurdi, the three years old Syrian boy who drowned and was washed up on the beach of Bodrum in early September 2015. Ilan Kurdi was certainly not the first child to drown in the Mediterranean, but it was the first time that the audience looked into the face of a child's core at close range. The images spread rapidly through the media and influenced international public opinion for weeks. But the price for this emotionalization was an abstract iconization that detached the pictures from their concrete circumstances of origin. Hardly anyone remembered a little later the 15-year-old Prosper or mother of Ireland Kurdi or the 12 other people who were in the boat with him and who all drowned as well. In the long run, the emotionalization with such images only leads to a new clichéd numbness and dulling of effect. Other cases of drowned children during dangerous crossings, which occurred afterwards, are only mentioned in brief. More and more media emotionalization is then required to achieve any effect at all. So cynicism seems to be inherent in the system itself. Nothing has captured this crisis like the picture that we began with last night. The three-year-old Syrian boy who washed up, drowned on a Turkish beach. The little boy whose lifeless body was washed ashore now has a name. Aylan Kurdi was three years old when he lost his life crossing the Mediterranean Sea to Europe. Over 300,000 people have attempted the dangerous journey to Europe this year, and more than 2,000 have paid with their lives, including many other children whose names we don't know. But it's these images of Ilan Kurdi that have finally brought the tragedy home to people in Europe and pricked the conscience of European leaders. My first example for the strategy of outbidding conventional forms of immersion is the 360-degree illustrated film Sea Prayer, based on the story of the same name by Afghan-American author Khaled Hosseini. In the film, which is about seven minutes long, a letter from a father to his son is read out from off. Both have fled to the Mediterranean coast during the Syrian civil war from their hometown Homs and now want to continue their dangerous flight across the sea. The letter once again evokes the lost past, which is illustrated in the form of a 360-degree animated sequence. 
my dear Marwan, in the long summers of your childhood, your uncles and I spread our mattress on the roof of your grandfather's farmhouse, outside of Homs. We woke in the mornings to the stirring of olive trees in the breeze, to the bleating of your grandmother's goat, the clanking of her cooking pots, the air cool and the sun, a pale rim of persimmon to the east. We took you there when you were a toddler. I have a sharply etched memory of your mother from that trip showing you a herd of cows grazing in a field blown through with wild flowers. I wish you hadn't been so young. You wouldn't have forgotten the farmhouse, the soot of its stone walls, the creek where your uncles and I built a thousand boyhood dams. I wish you remembered Homs as I do, Marwan. In its bustling old city, a mosque for us Muslims, a church for our Christian neighbors, and a grand souk for us all to haggle over gold pendants, and fresh produce, and bridal dresses. I wish you remembered the crowded lanes, smelling of fried kibbe, and the evening walks we took with your mother around Clock Tower Square. But that life, that time seems like a sham now. Even to me, like some long, dissolved rumor. First came the protests. Then the siege. Another example with a completely different approach also deals directly with the perspectives of the refugees. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu anna la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Rasulullah. Ich sehne mich nach der alten Zeit, nach Damaskus vor dem Krieg. <lacht> da hat die Stadt nie geschlafen, war rund um die Uhr wach. Und One example of this is a documentary My Escape by Director El Kassasa, which was released in 2016. My Escape tells the individual story of and fates of 15 fugitives from Syria, Afghanistan and Eritrea from the beginning of their escape to the successful end in Germany. The film is structured by interviews, but it attracts the attention of the viewers primarily through spectacular smartphone recordings that document the events during the escape. The fugitives are thus reduced to their story of escape and i.e. to a victim role, which again corresponds to the familiar cliched narratives. Zuerst habe ich mich von meinem Opa verabschiedet. Wir sind über 70 Enkel. Alle sind im Ausland. Ich war der Letzte in Damaskus. A different approach is taken, for example, by the 360 degree documentary Clouds over Sitra, which uses a new technology to capture the curiosity of viewers. The attention is used to make a relatively large public aware of the refugee problem. The outbidding is generated through technological innovative images and the possibility to look around the refugee camp with the 360 degree shots. In addition, the narrative is personalized by the narration from the perspectives of the 12 years old girl Sitra, who flees Syria with her family and gives insight into everyday life in a refugee camp in Jordan. In fact, the We Are application creates a claustrophobic impression that reinforces the feeling of being trapped, despite the freedom of movement within the camp. The project focuses on the refugee crisis in Syria and is intended to draw attention to the suffering of the refugees 
and the difficult conditions in the refugee camp. By concentrating on the girl's perspective, additional empathy is generated. The fugitive appears in the position of people in need of help whose plight is stereotyped. Samuel Weber once coined the term Edelkitsch for such media products, which were produced by media workers with well-meaning intentions. It should be noted that such web documentaries are created in the context of campaigns of the UNESCO, other NGOs and aid organizations. They function extremely efficiently, not despite, but because they rely on cliched narratives. The technology attracts attention and interest and, through emotional empathy, promotes a desire to help people. But the user's opportunities for participation are limited and do not go beyond the option of interactivity with the medium by clicking a donation button. Such web documentaries promote charity with their narratives, but hardly give rise to deeper consideration of solidarity. The first strategy of outdoing immersion reaches a limit. The problem with this strategy is that it only gets the attention of the audience if it shows the migrants as people in need of help. This may be good for raising funds, but it ultimately prevents an equal dialogue. The second strategy is negotiating participation and shows a complete different approach. This strategy is applied only in a few projects and pay attention to the inclusion of the perspective of the stakeholders, show migrants as individuals with their own power to act and negotiate new forms of participation, such as in so-called open space documentaries. A good example of this as Yasmin Kamanchi pointed out in her analysis, is a project Dadab Stories, which not only deal with a product-related form of participation in the final stage of a project, but which always comprise as well the organization of communication processes, which are at the core of the production process. Until 2021, Dadab in Kenya was the world's largest refugee camp, now closed, with up to 500,000 refugees at times. The camp is present in the news due to its gigantic dimensions and the amount of people in need of help, which can hardly be resolved into individual fates. In the Dadab stories, the refugees, with the support of the organization FilmAid, have the opportunity to organize communication in the camp. They become media makers themselves and thus set in motion a communication process within the camp that helps the refugees to negotiate participation. However, the project's reach beyond the camp was severely limited and reached only a very small public. This seems to be a basic problem of this strategy. The strategy of negotiating participation refers to the perspectives and positions of the respective stakeholders. It involves stakeholders in the production process on community building communication processes that likewise also lead to negotiation of participation, but they hardly attract any public attention. Apparently, their added value lies elsewhere. Web documentaries seem to be more suitable than documentary films for organizing participation in very different forms and meanings of the term due to their technological possibilities. This starts with prosumentary co-creation and extends to a wide range of collaborative work in networked and networking media, as Anaville once called it. Here, both the participation of the users and of those primarily concerned as stakeholders are given opportunities to participate or to help shape the process. The idea is that the stakeholders can best present their concerns themselves and express them in participatively organized communication processes. The basic question here is whether media participation can also lead to political and social participation. Different models of participation have emerged in the discourse on media and the public sphere, but they differ significantly. It is not only the manner of participation that is the subject of negotiation processes, but also what is understood by participation in general. Negotiation processes 
of participation can refer to the media presentation itself, for example, to the self-presentation of the participants. An example of this would be a project like Ying Jia, corner store in La Petite Patrie, in which a Chinese immigrant family tells its life story. The family members reflect on how they live their everyday life and how they interact with the other inhabitants of a small town in the Canadian province over two generations. Je m'appelle Ying, j'ai 15 ans et je suis arrivée ici quand j'avais 9 ans. I will start with the project Let's Stay, which was realized in Berlin in 2017 and is supported by public funds. In this project, people who had to flee from their home countries tells the stories of flight and their lives in Germany. Let's Stay is a YouTube channel with an associate website which was developed by and with refugees and media professionals and aims to present migrants as media professionals in Berlin. It takes an immediate, direct approach to the participation of migrants, which can be seen in two different areas. On the one hand, the migrants are presented in front of the camera as media professionals, i.e. as actively acting subjects, and on the other hand, the project team itself is partly made up of migrants who are given the chance to improve their professional skills and make them known through the project. In the total of seven episodes, migrants are not shown in the position of people in need of help, but as independent subjects who not only try to take their lives into their own hands, but also as media makers have a say in how their own story is told. A good example is perhaps the last of the seven episodes. From off screen, the setting is briefly explained. In der Waldemarstraße in Kreuzberg 36 in Berlin treffen wir uns heute mit Bino Bianski via Kuleka. Binos Heimatland ist Uganda. 2010 kam er als Flüchtling nach Deutschland. 2013 war er im Protestcamp am Oranienplatz in Kreuzberg aktiv. Seitdem engagiert er sich im Refugee Movement. Sein Medium ist das Radio. 2016 startete er sein Radioprogramm Wir Born Free Empowerment Radio. Zu empfangen auf 88.4 MHz in Berlin und 90.7 MHz in Potsdam. Für uns kam er auch vor die Kamera. Viel Spaß! Bino, first of all, tell us. When did you come to Germany and hmm. how? Yeah, that's a very big thing. And, uh, but uh, I will go short. Yes, I came here by plane and I landed uh, directly here in Berlin at Tegel Airport. And uh, yeah, right from Uganda. Of course, there is a destination, but uh, yeah, I came by plane. Yeah. And when and how did you get engaged with the refugees movement? Uh, my uh, arrival here, arrival, determined my uh, involvement in the refugee struggle because uh, when I arrived, the only way to stay in Germany, I had to seek asylum. That's what they told me. I tried to talk to some people who were close to me and uh, they said, but uh, no one knows you here. so. Maybe you were seeking asylum. I, I, even before I told them I want asylum, someone told me, are you a refugee? Are you seeking <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> The presenter in this episode, as in most of the other episodes, is Sami Ullah, a theatre maker from Pakistan, who is trying out a new medium here. The protagonists here become co-creators of a narrative that shows them as active, successful media makers and that to that extent, contributes to their self-empowerment. In addition, they are strengthened in their media professions. Web subjects such as Let's Stay do not address a preformed mass audience, such as a television program, but rather a limited circle of users. The videos of Let's Stay have a reach of between 200 and 500 users, 
which is very small. With a few to simpler projects, we can almost define a rule here. The more opportunities the migrants have to participate in the design of the project or are strengthened by it, the lower its reach. But even if projects like Let's Stay are hardly known beyond a local impact, the significance lies in a local space of action in which new professional opportunities and media expression possibilities are created for migrants. In the context of open space documentaries, I would also like to mention in particular the project Zuflucht, which was initiated by the University of Tübingen at the suggestion of Klaus Kleber, one of the most famous news presenters in German television. The university newsletter states, the aim of the teaching research project was to create an experimental space for creative collaboration between students and refugees at the Institute for Media Studies. The participatory character of the project is particularly decisive here. Fugitives do not appear as objects of reporting, rather journalistic paths were developed together with them. The project does not focus on spectacular escapes, rather it is interested in the everyday experience of the fugitives in their new homeland. In this context, Narima, one of the participants, reports on why she does not drink alcohol as a Muslim woman, how she deals with her friends in Germany, and highlights the possibilities of freely designing her life. Even if they drink alcohol or not, they will be ever my best friends. Projects like these, which mainly organize the negotiation of participation, have two problems. First, their scope is very often limited. The Let's Stay project in Berlin has hardly become known beyond its own network. I only found out about it, for example, because I know some of the organizers. The same goes for the Zuflucht project, which was only reported on in the newsletter of the University of Tübingen. Even the popularity of the television news presenter did not lead to greater public attention. Obviously, such projects address micro-communities, as are hardly noticed beyond the small circle of participants. The question arises if media participation and co-authorship is paid for by retreating to micro-communities, or does the establishment of micro-communities empowers the stakeholders growing up from the bottom? Does the organizing of bottom-up processes contribute to the empowerment of civil society stakeholders and thus also initiate complex negotiation processes which are prerequisite for the construction of post-migrant narratives? The second problem is more hidden and relates more to the long-term cultural conventions that the mass media also use. Could it be that those migrants who are given the opportunity to participate in designing media but do not always question the mass media strategies of portrayal then portray themselves in a way that corresponds to a cliched image of migration as expected by the majority society. The migrants' opportunities to participate in the shaping of the media are of little use if migrants are guided by the view of the majority society and present themselves as they believe they want to be seen. There is a danger that the image is familiar from the mass media are then merrily imitated and are restaged. The involuntary adaptation to expectations may lead to short-term recognitions, but reduces self-representation to the criteria of one's own need for help, integrability and usefulness as known from established stereotypical narratives. However, there is another strategy that creates the conditions for the representation to be questioned at all. The third strategy is a construction of relational complexity. This strategy is not simply concerned with complexity, but with whether a media representation is more or less complex in relation to established cultural or media-mediated conventions and stereotypes. The notion of complexity is here used as a player for a more differentiated, thoughtful and integrative perspective, which includes also multi-layered polyphone, media self-reflected, and even contradictional views. 
complexity in this sense is a prerequisite for being able to deal with ambivalence, ambiguity, and antagonism in negotiation processes. Media should offer the possibility of conveying the multi-layeredness of knowledge and perspectives, so that the basis for recognition and negotiation is created in the first place. Thus, by constructing complexity, it is also a matter of reflecting on and questioning the conditionality of a perception shaped by media or of media representations. Theoretical approaches have repeatedly called for complexity starting from a different, philosophically more radical understanding of participation as an examination of cultural forms of participation. For example, approaches by Jacques Rancière or, more recently, by Michaela Ott. She takes up the concept of dividuation, introduced by Gilles Deleuze and Marilyn Strasserne, and expanded with composite cultural theories by Edouard Clisson. The aim is to reflect on the media and cultural conditioning of one's own thinking and to enable new ways of thinking, new narratives and new pattern of action through irritation and recomposition. The media projects not only deal with the topic of migration, but also reflect on how media deal with this topic. In the spirit of Jacques Rancière, aesthetically resistant forms are developed that deny the fear or any form of immersive, sensitive, conventional or easily consumable perception. So concrete artistic solutions can take various forms. So you are based on the organization of a relational complexity which does not only develop intrinsically or media ontological from its own structure, but always in relation to other media. The concrete form of relational complexity depends on the respective projects and project context. Here is, to illustrate this argument plastically, an example from interventionist art. Ivar Weiss' intervention on the beach of Lesbos, for example, when he lays himself down for a photo in an inverted pose like the drowned island Kurdi, is not only a replica of the iconic frozen image of the dead boy, it is also a replica of the meteor exploitation circuits to which he consciously alludes and at the same time uses them for his own purposes. His image spread because it fits into exploitation cycles and at the same time irritates them by holding up a mirror to them. Web documentaries now have, in comparison to artworks or to conventional documentary films, greater possibilities for the construction of complex media representations and action. Let me mention some examples. The 2020 released web documentary Bruderland deals with migrants who came to the GDR as political refugees or as students or to earn foreign currency for the respective countries as so-called contract workers. This practice had unpleasant consequences for the migrants concerned because they were treated almost like forced laborers. In the GDR they were barracked and had hardly any say in the matter and the sending states brutally exploited them and deprived them of their wages. The project follows on from the web documentary Hoyas Werder which was also produced by Out of Focus Film Productions five years ago and now tells the prehistory of the xenophobic attacks in Hoyerswerda. The structure of the Bruderland web documentation is relatively static. You can either follow the arrows or special links to new chapters in each case or open the menu. The menu again shows the overall structure which is organized like a small multimedia book. The chapters follow the path of the migrants from their home countries to the GDR, reporting on their everyday lives, their problems and their attempts to remain in Germany. In the additional chapters, prologue, backgrounds and protagonists, general prerequisites are first clarified, important terms and facts are described, and finally the short biographies of the protagonists who made themselves available as interview partners for the web documentation are presented. Short interviews, on average about two minutes long, are embedded in the respective chapters. In Bruderland, 
we even encounter some of the protagonists already known from Hoyer's Werder, such as David Maku. The prologue opens with an interview with Mai Fong Kolat. The interview is followed by further information about the protagonist's life, including photos or her arrival in Rostock in 1982, where she started as a contract worker, i.e. as a cook. Today, as ex explained, she works as a coach, intercultural consultant and actress at the Maxim Gorky Theatre and the Berlin Schaubühne and is one of the initiators of the Bruderland project. The other interviews are structured similarly, i.e. the migrants are shown in a relaxed situation, today professionally successful and socially integrated, they talk about their problematic experience in the GDR. The protagonists are shown in a neutral but thoroughly composed, even designed environment whose style of furnishing correspondent more to an established middle class or educated bourgeois background. Here, for example, the well-known scientist Professor Dr. Ali Mayehu Gebisa from the University of Kiel. The high-quality, well-lit shots, composed with sufficient depth of field and blurred background, corresponded to the state of the art of interview shots with experts. The protagonists take the appointment seriously and appear in formal clothing. Even if the interviews with the migrants refer to their memories of the past, i.e. to the difficult living and working conditions in the former GDR, the production ultimately follows the dramaturgy of a success story. All of them have succeeded in staying or returning to Germany and making a career here. The self-portrayal of the migrants plays with the difference between the present of the project and the past of the remembered events. Here, memory not only serves to initiate a discourse, but also constructs a kind of habitus alongside the superficial narratives in the interviews, which change the meaning of the narrative. It is always a representation from the perspective of those who have learned to manage or to cope with the problems of the past, in which they are only tolerated as second-class people, exploited and subjected to repression and to find their place in German society. This creates an encouraging, empowering narrative, as it can also serve as a role model for other migrants. Web documentaries like Bruderland rely on editorial moderation. The participation of migrants does not take place directly, but is filtered and processed through editorial work. In this process, the participation of migrants is not about illustrating the perspective of the editorial team, but about the editorial team bringing the migrants' perspective to light and developing a narrative that empowers the migrants. This is especially successful when they are not presented as victims in need or help, but as self-empowered actors who actively tackle problems and develop solutions themselves. Bruderland has a relatively wide reach as the web documentation connects to well-known public discourses and offers interesting background information that users can access through interactive, self-determined reception. The fact that the web documentation won the prestigious Grimme Award may also have contributed to its dissemination. A completely different dimension of participation is evoked by the Limbo project, which does not rely on a direct form of participation, but rather artistically condenses authentic interviews with asylum seekers. Limbo is part of a campaign of the English daily newspaper The Guardian, which wanted to draw the attention of a broader public to the fate of asylum seekers in order to awaken empathy. Limbo addresses the situation of refugees who applied for asylum in the UK and are now waiting for the decision of the authorities. Between April 2016 and March 2017, 36,846 people applied for asylum. At that time, the number of those still waiting for a decision from previous cases was nearly 31,500. While asylum seekers wait for their home office hearing and subsequent decision, 
They live on a five pound a day and cannot work or choose where to live, while the Home Office aims to make an initial decision within six months, many wait longer. Despite access to services from refugee support organizations, asylum seekers are mostly unable to travel, work or learn English. The experimental documentary Limbo gives the audience a glimpse of the situation and the emotional state of Sue's waiting. It is based on interviews with asylum seekers from 12 countries as well as lawyers specialized in immigration. The refugees talk about their arrival in an unfamiliar city, the acute worry about relatives left behind, the problem of not being allowed to work and the fear of the interviews with the Ministry of Interior, which will decide on their application. They talking about the often slow and painful process of applying and then waiting to be reunited with their families. Limbo is just under nine minutes long and was elaboratedly produced using a new 360 degree technique. What is special here is above all the artistic alienation of the presentation. Semi-transparent objects and figures in a black and white depiction abstract from the realism and the image at, at the same time shows the perception of the living environment of migrants waiting for asylum. The many voice statements are excerpts of reports on the experience of asylum seekers in Great Britain which have been artistically condensed and visually alienated. They contain real experience and real statements and representations of migrants which, however, are not presented from the direct perspective of the asylum seekers, which would appear too clichéd, but instead build up a technically alienated view which at the same time arouses the interest of the audience through the new technological possibilities, as well as questions the previous view of the audience. They, like you, are in limbo. This is your room. You'll spend a lot of time here since you're not allowed to work. You feel like you're a prisoner. Not only in web documentaries, but even in documentary films, complexity can be built up by choosing a more radical aesthetic and reflecting one's own perspective, as Philip Schaffner showed in his film Havari which was only distributed by the internet. Schaffner used a three-minute YouTube video of a tourist on a cruise ship who filmed with an amateur camera a small inflatable boat drifting in the Mediterranean Sea with refugees. Using super slow motion, he slowed down the film to 93 minutes and achieves a radical aesthetic alienation. On the soundtrack, Schaffner montages the interviews he and his co-director Merle Kröger conducted with the refugees after their rescue, as well as original recordings of the Spanish Coast Guard's radio traffic. The artistic alienations deny the viewers a sensitive access to the plot and almost provokes him to deal with the mediality of what is shown. The images of boat refugees known from the mass media are evoked, and at the same time the media view of them is deconstructed through artistic alienation. Complexity is created here by questioning the established view and media expectations. No matter whether in projects such as Havari or web documentaries in a strict sense, the problem with media reflexive representations is that the subjects have only indirect influence on the representation. The design of a media product depends on the author or an author collective. What the projects have in common is that they can no longer be fixed to a certain media format or genre. Their characteristic feature is precisely the form-busting argumentation which is sometimes distributed across several media, thus forming a hyper and transmedia argumentation structure which usually offers sufficient complexity to be able to negotiate ambivalent and antagonistic positions. If I should formulate a preliminary conclusion 
I would above all point to the importance of a media ecological analysis of the concrete practices of the respective media milieus. There is no patent remedy for breaking through media exploitation cycles and certainly not for overcoming stereotypical narratives. It is only from the specific context and the treatment processes of the various media milieus chosen as a reaction to them that their respective meaning and effect can be determined. Even if all three of the different strategies presented here are justified, they always also have aporias and therefore do not automatically lead to the construction of post-migrant narratives. After all, it seems possible to use complex web documentaries to provide space for irritating negotiation processes in which different stakeholders can articulate their different ideas.